says, Now this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. And they asked him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. Then they said to him, Who are you that we may give an answer to those who sent us? What do you say about yourself? He said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. Now those who were sent were from the Pharisees, and they asked him, saying, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? John answered them, saying, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who coming after me is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. These things were done in Bethbara beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is he of whom I said, After me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore I came baptizing with water. And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Let's pray. Father, tonight as we study your word, I pray, God, that you would lead us, guide us into all truth. I pray, Lord, that you would, by your spirit, give us understanding. Lord, let us see Christ and all of his glory. Let us see the Lamb of God, as John pointed to, on the edge of the Jordan, who takes away the sin of the world. God, I ask tonight that you would anoint this time that we have together. Bless this time of study. Help us, Lord, tonight to draw near to you, to know you, to worship you, to serve you, God. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Tonight we are entering into a new section in our study of the Gospel of John, and we are beginning the narrative of the ministry of Jesus. And we have looked at the introduction over the last three weeks, this great prologue of this gospel, and we have seen the great glory of Jesus Christ, that in the beginning it says in verse 1, was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, that Christ is the Word, that He is the eternal Word, that He is the eternal God through whom or by whom all things were made. Not only that, but He gives light to all men coming into the world, that He is the source of all spiritual life, he is the sort of source of all spiritual light to everyone that is born in the world. And then we read last week in verse 14 that great statement that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld His glory. The glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That Jesus, the eternal God, was made flesh. He became Man, Amen. He did not cease to be God, but he became truly man. And we read in the word of God why this was. And we looked at several reasons why Christ became man. He became man to be our example. Amen. To live a life of full obedience to the will of God. To do what we could not do. To be our example, he became a man, number two, to be a sympathetic high priest. Because he was tempted in all points as we are, yet without sin. And because he experienced all that we experience, he is a merciful and sympathetic high priest. Who knows what we go through, who has experienced what we experience, one of the clearest 
Realizations of this took place in John 11 when he was standing at the edge of a tomb and it says when he was there with Mary and Martha and all of the people weeping that Jesus wept. So he knows what it is like to cry, to experience grief and mourning. He is a merciful and sympathetic high priest to his people. Then we saw lastly why he came. He came to die. He came to die in our place. Hebrews 2 and verse 9, it says that he was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, that he by the grace of God might taste death for every man. He became man in order to die in our place, to take the punishment for our sin in his body on the tree. And now we see John, after he has given us this great prologue, this great introduction, now we come to the narrative of the life and the ministry of Jesus. And he begins with the same narrative that you read about in the other Gospels with the forerunner, the man who went before Jesus. Look at this in verse 19. It says, Now this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? Here we see John's testimony of himself. We've already, if you've been with us during this time of study, been introduced to John the Baptist. Jesus called John the Baptist the greatest one that has been born among women. He was the last of the old covenant prophets. John the Baptist was the prophet who broke the 400 year silence that was there between Malachi and the time of John's ministry. He broke the silence and he came preaching and proclaiming a message to the people of Israel. And if you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Matthew chapter 3 because we see the great power and the message that John proclaimed. Look at this, Matthew chapter 3. In Matthew 3 and verse 1, it says, In those days John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent. For the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he who was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Now John himself was clothed in camel's hair, with a leather belt around his waist, and his food was locust and wild honey. Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region around the Jordan went out to him. And were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. Here we see the great power of his ministry and the message of repentance that he was proclaiming. And we see that there were people from all Jerusalem and Judea, all the surrounding area, going out to him to be baptized. Think about the power of this man's ministry that you have all of these people. He's not doing signs and wonders. We don't see any instance of signs and wonders in the life of the ministry of John the Baptist, but yet you have all of these people in Jerusalem and Judea and all the surrounding area of the Jordan going out to see him, going out to be baptized by him. And this is significant because this act of baptism was not something that the typical Israelite or Jew would have participated in. In fact, this was something that a proselyte, a Gentile, who was converting to Judaism would have went through. They would have went through this rite of baptism. But here you see these people from Israel as if they were saying to God, God, we have broken your covenant and we are repenting before you and we are coming and they, it says that they were confessing their sins and being baptized baptized in the Jordan by John. It was a baptism of repentance where God's own people, Israel, were saying to God, God, we are repenting. We're coming back to the covenant. We're coming back. But we see in the word of God, and we're going to look at it here in a moment, that there was a group of people that did not receive John's preaching. They did not repent. 
The Pharisees and the leaders, the Sanhedrin, rejected the ministry of John. Turn with me to the book of Luke, chapter 7. Luke chapter 7, verse 28. This is Jesus speaking of John the Baptist. It says, For I say to you, among those born of women, there is not a greater prophet than John the Baptist. What a statement. But he who is least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. And when all the people heard him, even the tax collectors justified God, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees and the lawyers, that is the experts in the law, the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. Here you see this great reality. If you do not Confess your sin, recognize your sin, realize that you are a sinner. You cannot be saved. Jesus in his ministry looked at the Pharisees, those who were religious and proud, and said to them, tax collectors and harlots will enter the kingdom before you because they repented at the preaching of John. And here we see in verse 30, they rejected the will of God for their life, that it was God's will that they repent and be made right. Here we see in John chapter 1, verse 19, that John is in the midst of his ministry. You have all of these people from Jerusalem and Judea and the area of the Jordan going out to him. And here you see a delegation go out. The Jews sent the priests and the Levites and they want to know, who are you? Who are you? Right? Who is this guy? And they come to him. It says in verse 20, He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. That's an emphatic. I'm not the Christ. He confessed, did not deny, but confessed. It's, a, it's an emphatic statement. I am not the Christ. I am not the Messiah. I am not the one that you are awaiting. And here you see that there was this expectation among the Jews for a Messiah. There was this expectation within the air that the Messiah was coming. And so much so that they are wondering, is this him? Is this the one? And he tells them, I am not him. It's also significant that John was not born under normal circumstances, right? Because his father went into the temple one day, Zacharias, and Gabriel appeared to him and told him, you're going to give birth to a son, you and your wife Elizabeth, even in your old age. And he even t tells him that this child will be great he, and the, the and, John, or Zacharias was a priest, and so no doubt there must have been people who remembered that this was going to take place, that this was a, and John the Baptist himself was also a Levite under the, in the priesthood. It was his lineage. So they're wondering, is this him? Is this the guy? He tells them, I'm not. Then... They asked him, you see this dialogue between them. They asked him, what then, are, are you Elijah? He tells them, no. Now you remember the prophecy that we looked at. Malachi chapter 3 and verse 1 and Malachi chapter 4 and verse 5. That it speaks of Elijah will come before that day. 
We also read in Luke chapter 1 and verse 17, speaking of the ministry of John, that he will go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah. But not only that, but he also dressed like Elijah. John was a weird guy. It says that he was clothed in camel's hair and a leather belt and ate locust and wild honey. He was an austere man. Disciplined. No luxury in the life of John the Baptist. He had a singular mission to prepare the way. And they ask, are you Elijah? It's interesting in 2 Kings 1 and verse 8, it says Elijah is described as a hairy man wearing a leather belt. Then they ask him, are you the prophet? Not just a prophet, but are you the prophet? And they were waiting on the one that Moses prophesied about. In Deuteronomy chapter 8, he said that God would raise up a prophet like unto me. Him you shall hear. And so they were waiting for the prophet. Like unto Moses. And he says, he says to them, no, I'm not him. Verse 22, then they said to him, who are you? We got to give an answer. They've sent us. What do you say about yourself, right? We've got to take an answer back. We've been sent by this delegation to find out who you are. So who are you? Verse 23, he said, I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. He tells them, I am the one that was sent before to cry out in the wilderness to make the way straight for the coming Messiah. That's, that's his whole ministry. That was why he was sent. He was sent before to prepare the nation of Israel for the coming of their Messiah. You get that picture that he was a voice in the spiritual wilderness of Israel. He broke in through the silence and he cried out to them, repent, the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The Messiah is almost here. You need to be ready for his coming. And he says, that is who I am. That is my entire ministry. Verse 24. Now those who were sent were from the Pharisees. And they asked him saying, Why then do you baptize if you are not the Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet? Pharisees, they were the religious of the religious among the Jews. They were the experts of the law. In most instance, instances in the narrative of the gospel, they are the chief enemies of the Lord Jesus within his interactions. And they say, if you're not any of those, then why are you baptizing? As if to say, who gave you this authority? He says to them, Verse 26, I baptize with water, but there stands one among you whom you do not know. It is he who is coming after me, who is preferred before me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to loose. Here we see, John tells them, all I can do is take you down into water. But there's coming one after me so much greater, I'm not even worthy to stoop down and untie his sandals. Here you see the humility of John the Baptist. He was always pointing people to Jesus. In fact, later on in John chapter 3, when his own disciples are mad that more people are actually going to Jesus than him. He tells them, this is why I came. This is the whole point for why I came. And he makes that famous declaration, he must increase and I must decrease. We 
We read these things were done in Bethbar beyond the Jordan where John was baptizing. But then we come to verse 29. Man on man. Verse 29. The next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him. Here we're going to see John's testimony of Jesus. We looked at John's testimony of himself, but now here we see John's testimony of Jesus. He's standing there and he sees Jesus coming toward him. Now, can you get a glimpse of this? He's there and he's probably not by himself. He's probably got a crowd around him. It's on the next day after this interaction. He sees Jesus coming toward him and he says, Behold, look, here he is. Look, behold, the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. He says, Behold, look, here he is. Behold, the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world. John, before anybody else, understood the ministry of the Lord Jesus. John, before even Jesus' own apostles, before his own followers, understood when he declared that he is the Lamb who takes away the sin of the world, he understood the purpose and the reason for why Jesus came. Now, they would have understood that language when John said, Behold the Lamb. They would have been familiar with lambs. They would have understood what the significance of what he was saying. In fact, it wouldn't be too much longer where they would be celebrating a feast called the Passover, where they were remembering God's deliverance that he had accomplished for them and bringing them out of the land of Egypt. And you remember what happened on that last night before they were taken out that the Lord told them in Exodus chapter chapter 12, that this is going to be the last plague that is going to come on the land of Egypt. And he told them, he instructed the children of Israel, he said to go and select a lamb of the first year. And he said on the 10th night, on the 10th night of this month, go and select a lamb and set it to the side and make sure it is without spot or blemish, right? And then on the 14th night at twilight, you are to kill that lamb and you are to take the blood of that lamb and you are to put it on the top of the door, on the two sides of the door. And the word of God says that when the judgment, when the death angel was to come into the land of Egypt, that when he saw the blood, he would pass over the door. That when the blood was observed, judgment would not come. When he saw the blood, it, judgment had been averted, or averted. And you realize tonight, listen church, when the Lord sees the blood, amen, there is no longer any condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, right? When he sees the blood, there is forgiveness of sin, amen. When he sees the blood. And he calls him the Lamb of God. In Genesis chapter 22, we read, when Abraham went up the mountain with Isaac, you remember this, when the Lord tested him and he was about to bring that knife down into the chest cavity of Isaac and the Lord said, no. Right? And there was a ram that was stuck in the thicket, right? Right? It pointed to what we see here in John chapter 1 and verse 29. Every day, every day when the high priest went to the temple, 
Every day in the morning they would take a lamb and sacrifice it. Every evening they would take a lamb and sacrifice it. Day after day, can you see the sons of Aaron going back to their dwelling with blood stains on their feet every single day? Day after day, year after year, month after month. It could never take away sin. It could never take it away completely. But John says, behold the lamb. The one sacrifice, the final sacrifice that takes away the sin of the world. He's called the Lamb, the Lamb of God. He's the Lamb of God, number one, because he was submitted to God. He was fully submitted to do the will of his Father. He said, I have not come to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. He lived a life in full subjection to the will of God the Father. You and I rebel against God. Adam rebelled against God. Everyone that has ever been born into this world has rebelled against God. But Jesus Christ lived a fully submitted and committed life to the will of the Father, and he did not sin. He did not sin. He was the submitted lamb. Secondly, he was the tested lamb. You remember how they took that lamb and they set it to the side and for four days they examined that lamb? For four days that lamb was there and they looked at it. They probably walked by it. They probably looked at its fleece. They looked at the wool. They looked at every part of that lamb. Jesus was the tested lamb. There was no blemish in him. There was no defect in his character and in his obedience to the will of God. He's the lamb. We see also he's the slaughtered lamb. He's the slaughtered lamb. Isaiah 53 says that he was led as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shearers is silent, so he opened not his mouth. He was the slaughtered lamb. The sacrificed. They lifted him up between heaven and earth. They crucified him. He suffered and died as the Lamb of God. But not only is he the slaughtered lamb, but he's also the glorified lamb. Because he didn't stay dead. Amen? He didn't stay dead. There's a few times where he's called the Lamb here in the book of John. A few other times in the epistles, Paul calls him our Passover Lamb. But when you come to the book of Revelation, it's one of the main titles that's given to him. He's called the Lamb. In Revelation chapter 5, you remember when John had that vision of heaven, right? And he saw the one who sat on the throne and he had a scroll in his hand and nobody on earth or under the earth or, or in heaven was worthy to open that scroll. And John is in heaven and it says in Revelation 5 that he begins to weep. Somebody comes to him and says, do not weep. Behold. Look what it says. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah has conquered. And it says that when John looked in the midst of the throne, it says there was a lamb as though it had been slain. Right? And it is standing there. Right? And they sang a song in heaven when they saw this. And it says they began to proclaim, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive glory and honor and power and majesty. He's the glorified Lamb. Amen. The submitted Lamb. The tested lamb, the slaughtered lamb, and the glorified lamb. He is the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That was why. I love that it says he takes it away. Cried out in John 19, it is finished. It's finished. That means it's, it's, it's paid in full, right? 
it's paid in full. That if we come to him, we don't add anything to the work, right? It's paid in full. He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He goes on and he says in verse 30, This is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. I did not know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. John says, I did not know him. Now, John and Jesus were cousins. We know that from the book of Luke. But John had been, it says, dwelling in the wilderness till the time of his manifestation. And he may not have known his cousin. He may not have grown up nearby him. He says here, I did not know him. And then it says in verse 32, And John bore witness, saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove, and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, Upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. John here recounts the baptism of Jesus. Now, presumably, just looking here at the context, this is six weeks after the baptism of Jesus. Because what took place immediately after Jesus' baptism? He was driven into the wilderness for a 40-day period. And now he comes back and John sees the one that he baptized. He sees the one that he took into baptismal waters those thir or six weeks earlier. And he bears witness to him and he says, I did not know him, but the one who sent me to baptize told me, when you see the Spirit of God descend upon him, it's him. Right? When, when you see this happen, we know in the Word of God that when Jesus was baptized... The Holy Spirit in visible form came down and it says remained or alighted upon him. That is remained upon him. The Holy Spirit in the form of a dove came down and then a voice was heard from heaven. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And John said... John said, when I saw that, the one who told me, the one who sent me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. The Lord told him, when you see this, it's he who's going to baptize with the Holy Spirit. Now, John, you remember, could only take people into water, right? John could only take them down in the water. Really, that's all any of us can do. That's all I can do for you. Even as a pastor, that's all I can do. I can only take you down into the water, right? I can't baptize you in the Holy Ghost. I can't give you a new heart. I can't baptize you into the body of Christ. I can't clothe you with power from on high, but Jesus can, amen? Jesus is the one who makes men new. Jesus is the one that baptizes us into the body of Christ. Jesus is the one who baptizes us with the Holy Spirit, amen? He is the one that makes us brand new. He's the one that can give you a new heart. Men can only take you to water. Men can only take you so far. But if you come to Jesus, he can make you brand new, right? He can take you and baptize you and take, take away your sin. He can take away your past and make you a new creature. He's greater than John. It's he who baptizes. Christ is the Holy Spirit baptizer. Isn't that awesome? If you've been baptized in the Holy Ghost, it's Christ that did it. Isn't that awesome? You've been made new, given a new heart, baptized into the body of Christ. It's Christ who did that. It's Christ. 
He is the Holy Spirit baptizer. And then verse 34, he says, And I have seen and testify that this is the Son of God. And I have seen and testify that this is the Son of God. He is, church, He is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He's the only means by which we can be saved. Peter said, Acts chapter 4, verse 12, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. There's no other mediator between God and man. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And he is the Lamb of God. You realize that on that cross, man, God help us not to ever take that for granted. That our sin, my sin, your sin was laid on him. Amen? That's a scandal. That's scandalous. That is a stumbling block to people. Because every other form of religion, it's always you working, you doing. You being good enough. You, right? It's always you. The gospel comes along and says you will never be good enough. You will never be good enough. In fact, your good deeds where you are trying to earn are filthy rags because they are so tainted with your sinful nature that even when you do a good deed, it's like a filthy rag before a holy God. We can't earn can't work, we'll never never be good enough. And then you have people separated from God, alienated from Him, that means you're not with Him, you're separated from Him, and so you want those benefits that come from God, you want those benefits, you want that joy and that peace and that all of those things. But yet you're separated from God and so you pursue it in other things. You pursue it in lesser things. And you experience with all kinds of different ways in which to kill the pain or pursue pleasure and all of those things. And the word of God makes it clear you will never be satisfied in those things. You'll always have to go on to something bigger, something different, because they will always wear out and fade and get old. You hear about people that experience in the new age. They start out with crystals and then they go on to other things and then they seek after other highs and then they veer off into this thing and then they go off into this thing and you got people that have tried everything. But you're never going to experience what you can only experience when you are back with the one who created you. Isn't that an amazing thing? Our heart is restless until we rest in Him, as Augustine said. So you have people trying to be good enough, 
trying to appease their conscience by doing good deeds and patting themselves on the back, but it won't get you to heaven. Praise God for people who build hospitals and donate to all of those things, but you won't get to heaven because of that. Thank God for that. And then you have people who are pursuing pleasure in every form, but they're never going to be satisfied. And all the while, there's one standing there, right? With his arms wide open. And he says, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, right? For I am meek and lowly of heart. Amen. The whole time he's standing there, I'm right here. I've paid for it all. I am the bread of life, right? I am the fountain of living water. If you will just come to me, you will be satisfied, right? You will be reconciled back to God if you will just come. Amen. He's the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together tonight. Now we are thankful for the Lamb of God. Amen. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. There is a fountain, it's filled with blood. It's drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. Amen. Amen. Jesus said that if anyone will come to me, I won't cast them out. Man, he said I won't cast you out if you'll come. Amen. Amen. Tonight, if you're away from the Lord, you don't know the Lord, the Lord Jesus, he paid for your sin in full. He died for you. He came to make you brand new. He is the one who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. He's the lamb who takes away your sin, my sin. He's the one that will save anyone who will turn from their sin and come to him. He'll save. He's mighty to save. Amen. He'll save you right now. Isn't that awesome? If you come to him, he'll save you right now. Amen. If you are away from the Lord tonight, come back home. Amen. Just come back home. You ain't going to find anything out in the world. How many have tried the world and and would say, you ain't going to find it out there? I've tried it. It's pleasurable for a season, but the end of it is what? It's death. Come back home. Just come back home. Just come back home. Amen? Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much tonight for your word. Thank you that you are the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Thank you, Lord, that you loved us so much that you took up a cross. You died a death you did not deserve to die. You died a death that I deserve to die. You paid a price that you did not owe, but I owed it, God. But you paid for it all in full. And Lord, now you stand there and you said, Whosoever shall call on your name, they shall be saved. 
Lord, we know right now that grace and mercy are extended to everyone. Everyone who hears the voice of the Son of God. Everyone who responds to that call, you will make new. Cleanse and forgive. And Lord, I pray tonight, if there's somebody here that's away from you, Lord, I pray, God, that they would come home. God, that they would come home. That they would come home, Lord. That you, by your Spirit, would just melt their heart. God, let them realize that you love them. You love them, Lord. With an unfailing love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.